No military operation is as difficult and dangerous as landing on an enemy occupied beach. In one of the most accurate cinematic depictions of the D-Day landings, the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan show this in harrowing detail. Men emerge from assault craft and struggle through the shallows, all the time in clear line of sight of an enemy that exacts a brutal toll on the attackers. We see anti-landing obstacles, gun emplacements, and the threat of mines. None of this was a surprise. Allied military planners knew exactly what was waiting for them in Normandy. But, largely thanks to one man, the British had a plan to minimise losses. Meet General Sir Percy Hobart, his 79th Armoured Division, and the specialised armour they developed, nicknamed Hobart's Funnies. In this video, we'll be looking at surviving examples of some of the funnies and asking what they could do, how they worked, why the Americans didn't use them, and how successful, how effective they were on D-Day. We'll also talk to John Pearson, the man who's restored the last surviving Valentine DD, and see his tank at one of the original training locations. Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings, which began on the 6th of June 1944, were always going to be a massive and highly hazardous undertaking. British, Canadian and US forces would land on five beaches, codenamed Sword, Juno and Gold in the east, through to Omaha and Utah in the west, while airborne forces made landings to secure objectives inland and protect the flanks of the beaches. The scale was vast. On the 6th of June alone, 160,000 troops would land from a fleet of 5,000 vessels, accompanied by an aerial armada of 1,200 aircraft. By the summer of 1944, the German occupying forces had had four years to create Festung Europa, Fortress Europe. Supervised in part by General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel, the strongest and best defended element, the Atlantic Wall, comprised a 20 kilometer deep strip extending from the Zuiderzee to the mouth of the Loire. This was dominated by coastal defense artillery and fortified emplacements, smaller guns designed to fire along the beaches to enfilade attacking troops, and Widerstandnesten, or resistance posts, mounting automatic weapons. The beaches were festooned with anti-landing obstacles, often bearing telemines, and any likely fill for glider landings was similarly obstructed. If the invasion was defeated, it would take the Western Allies at least two years to try again. And the omens, in some ways, were not good. The Dieppe raid of August 1942, an attempt to capture an enemy-held port, had ended in total failure, with over half the mainly Canadian raiding force killed or captured. The Calgary Regiment's Churchill tanks had also experienced major problems negotiating the beach and sea wall. This was, however, a learning exercise, and it taught two things. One, that trying to take a, a port would be too difficult because of the concentration of defences. And secondly, the landing force would need specialised help to crack the nut of enemy defences and obstacles. General Sir Alan Brooke, Chief of the Imperial General Staff, decided on the formation of a special unit, 79th Armoured Division, and, possibly against his better judgement, appointed Major General Sir P.C.S. Hobart, DSO, MC, to command it. Percy Hobart was an officer of the Royal Engineers who transferred to the Royal Tank Corps in the 1920s and became an advocate of using tanks in independent units rather than alongside slur-moving infantry. This didn't make him popular with the traditionalist element of the General Staff. He was also arguably just plain wrong. Despite having successfully trained the 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, in Egypt in 1940, he was sacked and sent home. Hobart spent most of 1940 as a corporal in the Home Guard. We have the makeshift pike he was issued with before receiving the rifle. He was then reinstated by Winston Churchill. Hobart was appointed to command a new formation, 79th Armoured. Now, the British 79th Armoured Division was unusual. It never fought as an armoured division normally would, but it's a holding unit 
for specialised vehicles that were then lent out for specific missions to other units. Here, Hobart was bright in his element. His ability to think outside the box, to solve problems, and his huge energy made him an absolute natural for this job. 79th Armoured rapidly became a collection of some of the strangest armoured fighting vehicles ever to see service on a battlefield. Tanks have revolutionised modern warfare, but you've got to be able to use them to the best advantage. One of the strangest of the funnies, and the one we're going to look at first, is the one that solved the problem of how to get armour onto the beach at that critical early landing stage minimising the possibility of the Saving Private Ryan scenario. Now, what we needed to do was ensure that tanks were landing at the same time that infantry were disembarking from their LCIs. That way, tanks could provide far support. The answer came from an emigre Hungarian inventor, Nicholas Straussler, in the form of duplex drive, or DD, Sherman. Straussler realised that if you massively increase the displacement of a tank, even though it's 25 tonnes of very solid metal, it will float. This worked by installing a rubberised canvas screen around the hull of the tank, braced on the inside by steel scaffolding and inflatable tubing. At the rear, two steerable propellers meant that not only could the DD float, but it could swim. Steered by the commander standing on a small platform and operating a long tiller. One of the problems that had to be solved was how to get power from the tank's forward-mounted transmission to the propellers, which obviously are at the back. Now, the way they managed to sort this out was to replace the idler wheels at the back with a second set of sprockets. So the propellers were driven by the tracks. Our DD is the last surviving example with the canvas screen, the supporting framework, and the duplex drive system intact. The black line you can see up there is the water line when the vehicle is afloat. And as you can see, there is actually very little freeboard. The system was initially trialled using a Tetrarch light tank in Brent Reservoir and then using Valentine infantry tanks at Stokes Bay uh, near Gosport and here at Studland Bay in Dorset. There's one remaining running Valentine DD tank, and it's owned by longtime friend of the tank museum, John Pearson, who has brought it here today on the 80th anniversary of Exercise Smash. So, John Pearson, you have had a huge amount to do with the commemoration yes. of Exercise Smash, and this is your baby. Yeah. This is the last surviving intact um, Valentine DD. Yes, that's right. Now, I know these things they weren't used uh, in active service. These were training tanks. Yes. Could you just talk us through the actual operation of the DD? Yes, how it works. How yes. it works, how you put the skirt up, okay. things like that. Well, the, the, the first part is to make it float, you have to displace its own weight of water. And that is done by uh, inflating these tubes with compressed air at about 30 pounds per square inch. That lifts this frame, the, the tube is attached to the frame, yeah. lifts the frame up to about nine feet high. Yeah. And then when the tank floats, the tank is actually hanging below the water surface and the water level is level with the top of the turret. Yeah. So while it's coming ashore, it just looks like a rubber boat. Right. As so, soon as you land, you let all the air out, down comes the frame with a crash and you've got a fighting tank on the beach. Is there a, um, any sort of scaffolding to brace it inside? There's, once you've got yes, the... there's folding arms there. Yeah. They operate just like your own arm. Um, I like that. And then when the screen is up, they go clunk and lock. Okay. And then there's a little hydraulic ram that pushes it over center and down it comes. So if the screen is nine feet high, I'm thinking that's just above the level of the turret. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's about, about 18 inches, two okay. feet of freeboard, I suppose. That's not very much, is it? No, no, no it as, isn't. As the guys out here actually discovered during yes. the exercise smash. The major problem, strangely, is not um, the height of the waves, yep. it's the distance apart of the waves. If right. they're too close, then the tank being so heavy can't rise to the next wave. Yep. And so the wave comes over the top and down, down goes the tank. It's actually the distance apart of the crests is the problem. I see. I hadn't actually realised that. Yes. Um, now, with the Sherman DD, we've got a different propulsion system because yes. there's an extra sprocket wheel. 
yes. is powered by the tracks. How does it work on, on the Valentine? The, it's, well, if you come to the back, I'll, oh, sorry, I'll show you. You have the, the basic drive is there's an engine, clutch, gearbox, just like a lorry. Yeah. And then what would be the back axle runs across and drives the tracks. Right. From the back of the back axle, there's another cog, and that brings the propeller drive out here. So it's directly driven from the transmission. Okay. And uh, to put it in and out of gear, that's taking it out of gear, so it's out of the way right. for while you're um, uh, going cross country. Yep. It was into gear, a dog clutch engages there, and, and that's the drive. Okay. The steering is just like an outboard motor. Right. That's a lot more, a lot the, more direct. I mean, the, yes. The, so you've actually got the drive directly from the engine. Yes, that's right. Rather than via the tracks. Yes. The, uh, yes. The, the, uh, the, the lift and the steering controls are duplicated for the driver yeah. uh, by hydraulics. And, uh, uh, but this is for the initial run ashore. Yeah where the thing was launched at about 5,000 yards out. Right. And uh, for the first part, the crew would be all up here on, uh, on top yeah. and would get down under armour at the, uh, for the last of the run ashore. Yeah. And the driver would be steering by use of a, yeah, a almost like a, a submarine um, a periscope. Very tall periscope. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that, so there are some differences between this yes. and, and, and the Sherman DD. Um, now, I know, as we said earlier, the Sherman DD took over from this. These were used as training vehicles. Yes, they were. Um, they were what, intended to be the assault tank for D-Day. Yeah, what was the problem, do you think? Was well, it availability or...? Um, no, I mean, it's just by 1944, it was an obsolete design. Yes. And the initial plan was that you were going to have howitzer armed uh, uh, Valentines right. for the initial attack. Then they'd be followed up with um, high velocity, in this case, the six-pounder, yeah. for uh, attack against armour. The next wave would be uh, wading Shermans, and then the last wave would be the crews left over from the Valentines. They would right. bring new Shermans ashore, and on the night of D-Day, you would swap the crews over, and then the whole thing would be a Sherman operation to go okay. forwards on D-Day plus one. Yeah. They couldn't get the howitzers to work. Right. The uh, anti-tank version has to float with the gun reversed. Oh, I was just about to so, say, yes. yeah. of course, if you use those, it has to land, come out of the water, drop the screen and turn the turret before it can fire. And yep. so, although the later models of uh, Valentine had the same ammunition, same gun really, as the Sherman, they were changed as soon as, as, soon as they became available. The last unit to change was, I believe, the 4th, 7th Dragoon Guards. Right. And they only swapped over to Shermans about 10 days before okay. D-Day. Yeah, yeah. So it was nearly a mixed formation that went on D-Day, yeah. but in fact, none were ever used. John, very kind of you to talk to All us. Right. Thank you very That's much me. indeed. Cheers. This demonstrated that the system worked, but also how hazardous it could be. In any sort of running sea, a wave over the top of the screen would send the tank down very quickly indeed, and probably take the crew with it. This is Fort Henry. It's an observation bunker. It's built so that uh, senior officers, people like General Eisenhower, Montgomery, uh, King George VI, the Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, could observe exercise smash. Uh, that was a large scale live fire exercise in April 1944. It's a real rehearsal for D Day. But tellingly, next to it, there is a memorial to six men of the 4th, 7th Royal Dragoon Guards who lost their lives when their DD tanks were swamped by the waves out there in Studland Bay. Seven DD tanks sank, uh, of which five were blown up by the Royal Navy, uh, and two remain still on the bottom of the bay 80 years later. Eventually, 1,093 Shermans will be converted to DDs by the US and British armies. They weren't part of 79th Armoured at this stage, though they would be later, but they're attached to their respective US, Canadian and British armoured divisions. If you want to know more about D-Day in general, or Hobart's 79th Armoured Division in particular, these books, published by the Tank Museum, are essential reading. Click the link to buy your copy and support the channel. The beaches and landing grounds of the Atlantic Wall had been heavily mined, and clearing these was going to be a highly dangerous business for combat engineers operating under fire. Mines, and particularly the highly effective Teller anti-tank mine, 
weren't just laid at mine fields, but they're also fixed onto anti-landing obstacles like this hedgehog. And a proportion of them were fitted with anti-handing devices, or they were rigged in sequence with things like anti-personnel mines to make clearance a very, very hazardous uh, occupation. The solution for D-Day was the Sherman Crab. Now, this is a flail tank with a rotating steel drum fitted with weighted chains that will cut barbed wire and detonate mines. The flail idea first been tried in North Africa with 25 Matilda II tanks being equipped with flail drums powered by a separate Ford V8 engine. Although these were reasonably effective, the Matilda Scorpion, as it was called, raised so much dust that the crews were blinded and engine and air filters clogged up. A parallel project with a similar auxiliary engine, the Matilda Baron, was also underway in the UK, and attempts were also made to produce a Valentine flail. But the design eventually chosen by Hobart was the Sherman Crab. The M4 Sherman was something of a gift from the gods to the British Army. Available in large numbers through the Lend-Lease programme, it was that rare thing, a reliable tank that was easy to maintain and crew. Unlike the earlier prototypes, the Sherman Crab doesn't have an auxiliary engine to power the flail. It's actually got a power takeoff from the tank engine itself. Uh, that's the power takeoff, and these are the hydraulic rams which are used to raise and lower the flail. Coming forward, uh, we have the rotating drum. That's got uh, 43 weighted chains, and those rotate at 142 RPM. Although there is a gearbox, so you can vary the rotation speed depending on ground conditions. We've then got these discs, uh, which are designed to cut barbed wire. Coming around to this side of the tank, uh, there's a blast shield to protect the crew from detonation of mines. Um, we've lost the bow machine gun, because obviously that's obscured by the shield, but we retain the 75 millimeter main armament and the coaxial machine gun, so the flail can still function as a gun tank once it has finished flailing. Uh, down towards the rear of the tank, there is a mechanism by which uh, the flail can drop marker poles, smoke grenades, or a chalk trail to indicate the cleared route. The most versatile of the funnies was the Avery, Assault Vehicle Royal Engineers. Based on a Churchill, the Avery retained the hull, turret, and mechanicals of a gun tank, but was adapted in a number of ways. Firstly, the Churchill gun tank interior was stripped out to allow for the storage of engineer stores, and then the main gun was removed and replaced with this. And this is a weapon called a petard. It's a 29mm spigot mortar. The spigot, the 29mm part of the weapon, was a hollow tube over which the tail of a drum-shaped projectile was fitted. Called the flying dustbin, the tail contained a propellant charge which would send the projectile and its 18 kilogram explosive charge up to 140 metres. This was very effective against obstacles and fortifications, but from the crew perspective, it's got one big disadvantage. After you fired it, it needs reloading from the outside. So a crew member has to climb up through this hatch, put another projectile in. That is not the healthiest thing to do in combat. The Avery was also equipped to carry and deploy a range of other pieces of equipment. These included the bobbin, a three metre wide reel of canvas reinforced with steel rods, which could be laid as a trackway across soft mud or sand. A small box girder bridge, capable of spanning a 30 foot gap and supporting vehicles up to 40 tonnes. Double onion demolition charges attached to a steel frame, or a brushwood and timber fascine which could be dropped into something like an anti-tank ditch to enable crossing. The Avery had a crew of six, a driver from the Royal Armoured Corps, and then five Royal Engineer Specialists, uh, known in the British Army as sappers. Now, quite apart from the equipment that the Avery carries, inside was a mass of onboard stores, things like demolition charges, and they were deployed through these extremely convenient sponson doors in the side of the tank. If the Avery was the sapper's Swiss army knife, by far the most intimidating of the funnies was this, 
the Churchill crocodile. There's something really terrifying about the thought of facing a flamethrower, even the man pack type. And the crocodile was a lot more powerful. Captain Andrew Wilson, MC, who commanded 13 Troop C Squadron, 141 Regiment, Royal Armoured Corps, described the demonstration flaming of a pillbox by a crocodile in his book, Flamethrower. It struck the concrete with a violent smack. A dozen yellow fingers leapt out from the point of impact, searching for cracks and apertures. All at once, the pillbox was engulfed in fire, belching, twisting, red roaring fire and clouds of queer-smelling grey-black smoke. Then another rushing. This time the rod went clean through an embrasure, smacking, belching, roaring. The flame shot out through the back of the pillbox, fanning like a blowtorch. Experiments with flamethrowers have been carried out since the early stages of the war, with Valentine tanks, universal carriers, armoured lorries, and the experimental oak device fitted to the Churchill. The oak flamethrower consisted of a forward-mounted flame projector linked to a fuel tank mounted on the back of the tank. Three were trialled in the Dieppe raid, but it wasn't a success, and a new system was developed, which was eventually fitted to around 800 Churchill Mark 7s, converting them to Churchill crocodiles, while still retaining the original 75mm main armament. Flame gun, which replaced the Bisa MG on the front of the tank, could project a jet of liquid fire up to 150 yards, although 80 yards was more normal in a battlefield situation. Pipes ran underneath the floor of the fighting compartment to this, and this is a six-ton armoured trailer. That contained 400 gallons of flame fuel plus five cylinders of compressed nitrogen, and that acts as propellant. This coupling is designed so that in an emergency, the trailer can be jettisoned from inside the tank. The crocodile was horribly effective. Human beings are naturally petrified of being burned alive, and the crews found that very often a shot near a bunker would have the occupants either retreating or surrendering in sheer terror. Crocodile crews were hated by the enemy, and Captain Wilson, who commanded a crocodile troop from Normandy through to the Rhine, describes at least one crocodile crew attempting to repair their broken down tank, being shot by their German captors out of hand. Crocodiles weren't deployed on D-Day itself. The close confines of a beach weren't suitable, but they would go on to be used in the rest of the campaign in Northwest Europe, up to their last action, the flaming of buildings at the Belsen concentration camp. The camp had been liberated by the British army and the buildings were infected with typhus. So the crocodiles, along with flame-throwing universal carriers, burnt the huts down in order to kill off the disease. Some years ago, I met an old soldier who'd been flame gunner on that occasion. He said he had nightmares about it for years afterwards. So how effective were the funnies? Did the Sherman DDs and the specialised armour of 79th Armoured make a difference on June the 6th, 1944? The assault on Gold, Juno and Sword, the British and Canadian beaches, spearheaded by DD tanks and then by LSTs carrying the assault teams of 79th Armoured Division, crabs, avries and armoured bulldozers. The US Army, landing on Utah and Omaha beaches, used DDs, but they missed out on the use of avries and flails. A request for these from General Omar Bradley wasn't received until after a demonstration in February 1944 by which time it was too late to produce the vehicles and train crews, especially for the Churchill, which wasn't part of US armour inventory. On D-Day itself, the performance of the DDs varied enormously, largely depending on current sea conditions. They were designed to cope with a swell of up to one foot, that's 30 centimetres. And they were supposed to be launched from LSTs, landing ships tank, up to two and a half to three kilometres out. In the event, more than half were landed directly onto the beach from LSTs and LCTs. At Sword Beach, the DDs of the 13th, 18th Hussars uh, left their LCTs, swam ashore, the sea was nice and calm, and cleared their objectives. They landed 33 out of 40 DD tanks successfully. 
On Juneau, the 6th Canadian Armoured Regiment landed 10 tanks from LCTs with 30 more swimming ashore under heavy shell and mortar fire. These destroyed two 75mm guns, one 50mm gun and six machine gun positions. At Gold Beach, rougher conditions made the journey ashore slower and more difficult. The Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry landed directly from LCTs, but found their objectives had already been cleared by flail tanks that had landed earlier. Now, an awful lot's been said and written about the US Army's use of DD tanks during Operation Overlord. It's not all bad news. Uh, the US 70th Tank Battalion actually managed to land all of their DDs successfully, apart from four that were lost when uh, the ship carrying them was sunk by enemy gunfire. The problem then was that they were confused by a massive smoke screen and they actually landed two kilometers away from their aiming point and found difficulty actually getting off the beach. At Omaha Beach, the story is one of partial disaster. The 741st Tank Battalion uh, had their DDs launched four and a half kilometers out as opposed to the supposed maximum of 3K. Um, they are battling uh, an offshore current, waves of six feet, that's up to 1.8 meters, and 27 out of 32 of their tanks are lost. Fortunately, most of the crews are saved. On the other hand, 743rd Tank Battalion landed their DDs direct from LSTs. All 32 got ashore, did their job. This aside, the DDs was a success. Few, if any, were lost through enemy action while afloat, and the device enabled the weight of armour landed early to be increased by almost 100%. For the remaining funnies, the crabs and the avries, just the process of offloading onto the beach from LSTs and LCTs under fire was fraught with danger. At Sword Beach, LCT 947, carrying two crabs and four avries, beaches, drops her ramp, and then manages to offload one avery. But the second avery is hit while she's still on the ramp, slews round, and onboard explosives start to detonate. The LCT is forced to withdraw, carrying quite a number of dead and wounded personnel on board. With the patchy performance of the DDs, a number of which were landed late, direct from their LSTs onto the beach, crabs and avries provided fire support for the infantry. At La Riviere, crabs of the Westminster Dragoons flailed between the beach obstacles uh, to reach the coastal road and opened up the route to Vier sur Mer. An avery then destroyed an enemy occupied house and another knocked out an 88 mm gun position. And this enables the DDs or the 4th 7 Dragoon Guards to pass through. By nightfall, 12 out of the 50 crabs and 22 out of the 120 avries landed had been knocked out. But, as the divisional history put it, the liberal use of their armament had compensated on beaches where the DDs were late. Of the four assault squadrons Royal Engineers on the British One Corps front, uh, they deployed eight fascines and 10 small box girder bridges from their avries. As the beachhead expanded into the dense Norman Bocage countryside, avries in particular were in demand, using their petard mortars to breach the tall hedge banks. 79th Armoured and its range of highly specialised vehicles would go on from Normandy throughout the rest of the fighting in northwest Europe. Crocodiles frequently operated in cooperation with petard armed avries. The Avery firing a flying dustbin to crack out in the fortified position before it was flamed by the crocodile. DDs, which the division inherited after the beachhead was established, would play a significant part in the Valkyran Islands campaign and the Rhine crossings. Other vehicles, such as the Centaur tank dozer and the Ram Kangaroo troop carrier, would also be added to its orbit and would insist the division in playing its part up to the German surrender in May 1945. D-Day, though, remains the operation that 79th Armoured were mostly remembered for. This is when a strange collection of highly specialised vehicles made a real difference to the success of the landings. In the words of the divisional history, where massed armour led 
with specialised tanks in the van, the hard crust was broken with a fraction of the loss of life, limb and time. Most of our beaches were open to traffic within a few hours of touching down. The liberation of Western Europe was underway. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and if you can, support us on Patreon. If you want to read more about D-Day and support this channel, these two books, both published by the Tank Museum, are available from our online shop. This 2023 edition of David Fletcher's Vanguard of Victory, the 79th Armoured Division, covers the history and development of the unit and its specialised armour, covering the actions in which they took part from D-Day onwards. And this edition of the Tank Museum Guide to D-Day, previously published by Haynes, has just arrived. It covers the new technology, machines, systems, structures and innovations that made this, the largest seaborne operation in history, a success. This 2024 80th anniversary edition includes three new chapters, including one dedicated to Hobart's Funnies. They're only available from the Tank Museum shop. Click the link in the description to find out more.